The Spirit of God moves in quiet and mysterious ways. In and through us, like the breath we breathe. He's always been there, using our broken past for his purpose. Only look back to remember when he provided for you. He's here, now, moving in our midst. Live in his present. Be a light and leave behind where he was to follow his lead. He's waiting for you to step out in faith and into the unknown to join him. Trust him with your future and fear not, for he is with you, pulling you from the darkness and carrying you into his light. Rejoice in confidence as you watch him transform the spaces around you and rest in his perfect peace for he is with us. Well, good morning, Coral Church. It is good to have you here uh, in the building, of course. Those of you who are joining with us and worshiping online, thank you for being with us. Those of you in uh, Skagit, so glad that you're here today. The, the group down in Belize, uh, just great to be able to be together uh, as we go enter into this Christmas season. Before I start my sermon, I do want to mention uh, this last Friday, uh, I want to say a very big thank you to those of you who are involved in Cornwall at the Mall. What a tremendous time, great outpouring of your generosity, great to be together. And many of you online participated participated with the Amazon uh, wish list and just want to thank you so much for that. And in Skagit, I understand that the, uh, the Cornwall Toy Lane was just outstanding on Friday night. What a way for us to bless the community. Just want to again thank you for that. Well, we are full on into the Christmas season now and probably in your life or family or, you know, circle, there are some Christmas traditions that you're a part of. I mean, for us here at Cornwall, the Cornwall at the Mall and the Toy Lane and, and Skagit, that's kind of a part of our tradition. You have your own traditions in your own family, and maybe, maybe one of the traditions that you have is as a family or as an individual, you watch certain Christmas movies every year. There are certain ones that you're just like, this is part of our whole deal, and and I mean, it can be anything. I mean, there's so many, you know, claymation and animation and hallmarks 24/7 of I'll just be careful because my mom might be watching right now. But there are comedies and there are classics, 34th Street, you know, all that. And there's the ongoing debate, is Die Hard really a Christmas movie? I, I know all that. And maybe one of the movies that you watch is one that's been a, a Christmas tradition really for, a, not the movie necessarily, but it's been a part of a Christmas tradition for 178 years. Because in 1848, there was a novella published by a man named Charles Dickens. It was called A Christmas Carol. 178 years. And in those 178 years, A Christmas Carol, listen to this, has never ever been out of print. I don't know if you've ever known anyone who's an author or tried to have something printed. It's never been out of print, which is phenomenal. And over those 178 years, I mean, it has been in print, obviously, but it's been movies, it's been stage productions, it's been ballets, it's been operas, it's been musicals, it's been animated, it's been Muppets, it's, I mean, it's everything. And, and you know the story, basically, that there's this, this crotchety old guy, Ebenezer Scrooge, whose heart is smaller than the Grinch's heart, and he, on Christmas Eve, he's visited by three ghosts. The ghost of Christmas past, the ghost of Christmas present, and the ghost of Christmas future. And because of those visits from these ghosts, his perspective is changed. His perspective of himself, his perspective of others, his perspective of life is changed, and he's transformed because of that. And we decided this year, leading up to Christmas Eve, uh, that we would kind of loosely hang our Christmas series on that whole idea of Christmas past, Christmas present, and Christmas future. And our prayer is that as we look at God's word and we look at these perspectives, that we would change our perspective about ourselves, our perspective about others, and most importantly, our perspective about who we are in God's presence, that God is with us. And so we're going to do that, and we'll do that in that order, Christmas past, present, and future. So today, then, to start it off is Christmas past, and there's really no better place to start the whole Christmas season than in Luke chapter 2, verse 11, where it says, today in the town of David, 
A Savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. Um, I wonder, is there a way that we can get a little more lights in? I just can't see you. Can we just get a little more lights in here? For me, that would be super helpful. I would, I would love that. I mean, otherwise, I don't know if anyone's even here. Um, I hear you. I just can't see you. A- anyway, so, so Luke chapter 2, we'll, we'll work on those lights in, in the house here. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. I love what Pastor Randy just said in the Advent candle. That's just the idea of a rescuer. You know, the Savior is a, a rescuer that comes along. And, and that's this, the Christmas story. But it says today, well, well, wait a second. I thought we were doing Christmas past. So, okay, we gotta stop. We have to back up now if we're gonna do Christmas past. If I say the phrase Christmas past, and if I say that kind of uh, apart from the, the, the Dickens um, Christmas carol, if you think of Christmas past in your own life, Probably there are some thoughts from your childhood, maybe from growing up, maybe there's some Christmases that are like, you're just like, oh, that was great, that was the first Christmas we had a child, or that was when I was engaged, or, or that's when I graduated, whatever it might be. Uh, for me, I mean, uh, let me give you a glimpse of my Christmas past. This is a picture from Christmas past when I was in the sixth grade. Don't laugh at my hair. <laughs> I heard that. I was in the sixth grade, that's why I've never cut my hair since. I was in the sixth grade, and we had just moved into a new house, and that Christmas tree, my mom had to have a noble fur. She loved the whole layer thing of a noble fur. You can have your own opinions, but she was all about the noble fur. And for the next 10 or 11 years, uh, maybe even 12, in that living room at that spot with those noble furs, my Christmases were filled with warmth, uh, great memories, good family, wonderful times. But about 12 years later, while Christmases were still great, there were some things that had happened. There were some things that happened health-wise. There were some things that happened relationally in our family. There were some things where, where Christmases were still good, but, but there was some pain involved, and, and there was some loss. And, and it wasn't quite the Hallmark movie moment that I had known all through my childhood. And maybe some of you have experienced that as well. Some of you sit here and say, you, yeah, I know, Christmas is not my favorite season. Or there are certain Christmases that I, I look back on Christmas past, I, I, I don't rejoice in those. In fact, maybe some of you, if you were to give a letter grade to some of your Christmases past, you would give it the grade D because of maybe some distance or a diagnosis or a disease or a divorce or a death or some dysfunction or some difficult thing or some destructive behavior or some pattern. Something happened in life and it wasn't so wonderful. And the truth is, when we think Christmas past, Christmas past can be a source of nostalgia, but also mortification. The the nostalgia, these thoughts, these memories are great. We like to retell them. We like to to share about them. We like to laugh. Every year we think back to those times. But maybe there's some mortification as well. We would just as soon forget that. We don't tell those stories anymore. We don't even want to be reminded of those things. And that may be your reality, And I suppose the good news is, is that's the reality of the original first Christmas story as well. Because there were parts of great nostalgia. I mean, it says Mary pondered these things and treasured them in her heart. She thought about them. They were wonderful memories. But there were horrible things. The the death of all the baby boys in Bethlehem. We, We don't want to talk about that story. And even when the Christmas passed of the whole original Christmas, there are stories that are beautiful and stories that are very, very painful. And so today I want us to look at that and to see how that plays out. Now, when it comes to the Christmas story and Christmas uh, sermons, usually um, they're pulled out of uh, either some of the prophecies, usually Isaiah, but Luke chapter one and two is the primary go-to, especially Luke chapter two. It's the one we hear, it's one that, that Linus quotes in the Charlie Brown special. I mean, Luke chapter two is it. But Matthew chapter one and two have some Christmas stories as well. And today what I would like to do is I would like to focus our attention to Matthew chapter one. So if you have your Bible, a phone, a tablet, I would encourage you to open up to Matthew chapter one, uh, one of the passages that doesn't get as much attention during the Christmas season. And I'll just say that today, I'm not sure if this is a sermon as much as it is a a story that I want to tell and a journey that I want us to go on. And if at the end it's a sermon, great, and if it's not, great. But Matthew chapter one, verse 18, says this. 
This is how the birth of Jesus came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph. I would guess that the vast majority of us here know that part of it. Of course, there's Mary and Joseph, and they were engaged. They were pledged to be married. That's, that's where it starts. And that's good if we're talking Christmas past, it's before Jesus is born. It's a good place, to, good place to start. But what's interesting is that's verse 18 of chapter 1. And we just skipped over 17 verses, chapter 1, verse 1 through 17. And most often in services and sermons about Christmas, we skip over Matthew 1, 1 through 17. And I understand why. I mean, if, you can, if you've got your Bible open or your tablet, you see why. But I think we do ourselves a big disservice because if we skip over those first 17 verses, it's like having Christmas without a Christmas tree. I mean, this is very important. Because in those first 17 verses, we see the very first Christmas tree. Because the very first Christmas tree is a family tree. It's the genealogy, it's the family tree of Jesus. It's often referred to as the begats, because in the King James and some of the older versions, it talks about so-and-so begat so-and-so, who begat so-and-so, who begat so-and-so. And it's this long list of names. I don't know if you know what this is. This is an antique, uh, by the way. Uh, <laughs> true story, you know, we had some young musicians up this weekend. Yesterday I said, do you guys know what this is? They just looked at me like, no? Well, let me tell you, this is called a phone book. And, uh, and they used to have these things. We used to have these things that were connected to our walls in our house called a landline. But in a phone book, there's just page after page of names and numbers. And this is how we used to try and find out someone's phone number. Had these things. And to be quite honest, to sit down and read it would be terribly, terribly boring. It's just like name after name, names we've never heard of, names we might not be able to pronounce, names we don't, we don't know. And Matthew chapter 1, 1 through 17, reads somewhat like a phone book. In fact, Dr. Ray Bakke, he, he referred to it as, as a cemetery tour because you're going through generations of dead people. That's why we don't normally read Matthew 1, 1 through 17. That's why there's not a lot of sermons about that. That's why it's not our favorite scripture when someone says, what's your favorite part of, of the Christmas story? <laughs> Matthew 1, 1 through 17, just can't get enough of it. It's so rich. Do you love it? <laughs> See, for us, it seems boring. It seems lifeless. It seems useless. It seems like filler. But let me tell you why it's so important. One is that it shows that the Christmas story is not just some story in a galaxy far, far away long ago. It's not just a once upon a time. It's rooted in history. And this is the climax of a bigger story. It's, it's the pinnacle. It's what everything points to, and it is rooted in history. It's real. In the Jewish mind, genealogies were so important. It was like your resume. It, it, was, your, it was your credentials. It validated you. This is who I am. This is who we are. It was very important in the Jewish mind. And some of you might be saying, that's fine. I know the Christmas story is real. I'm not in the Jewish mind. It does still. It's boring to me. Let me tell you why it should be important to us. Because what I hope to show you today is that as we look into this genealogy, into this first family tree of Jesus, we see a very deep and important theological truth that has profound personal implications for each one of us. And I hope that's what we walk away with today. So a couple weeks ago when I was preparing this message, I thought we, we ought to read through it. And I thought, you know, that's, it's terribly boring. It's like reading through a phone book. And so we're not going to read through it today. But I would like to present it to you. Matthew chapter 1, 1 through 17. The genealogy of Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac. Isaac, the father of Jacob. Jacob, the father of Judah and his brothers. Judah, the father of Perez and Zerah, whose mother was Tamar. Perez, the father of Hezron. Hezron, the father of Ram. Ram, the father of Aminadab, or <laughs> Aminadab will do you or yabba dabba do you. Aminadab, that, that was my part by the way. Aminadab, the father of Nashon. Nashon, the father of Salmon. But in the Northwest, we call him Salmon. And Salmon always spawned, so you know he has a kid. Salmon, the father of Boaz, whose mother was Rahab. 
Boaz, the father of Obed, whose mother was Ruth. Obed, the father of Jesse. Get Jesse. Jesse, the father of King David. Now, David was the father of Solomon, whose mother had been Uriah's wife. Solomon, the father of Rehoboam. Rehoboam, the father of Abijah. Not Elijah, Abijah. Abijah, the father of Asa. Asa, the father of great jumping Jehoshaphat, who actually never jumped. He stood firm. That's why he was great. Jehoshaphat, the father of Joharim. Joharim, the father of Uzziah. And Uzziah, the father of Jotham. Jotham, the father of Ahaz, and we'll call him Ahazmat because he was hazardous material. He was a horrible, evil, wicked king, so much so that he did a child sacrifice of his own son in the fires, but that's Ahaz. Ahaz, the father of Hezekiah. Hezekiah, the father of Manasseh, not Mufasa, Manasseh. Manasseh, the father of Amon, or Amon. Amon, the father of Josiah. Josiah, the father of Jeconiah and his brothers at the time of the exile to Babylon. Now, some of your translations may call him Jehoiakim. Don't get all high-centered on that same family, different name. But after the exile, Jeconiah, or Jehoiakim, was the father of Shealtiel. Shealtiel is the father of Zerubbabel, and I don't care who you are, that's just a fun name to say. <laughs> Zerubbabel, the father of Abiad, and Abiad, 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 that's not all, folks. Abiad is the father of Eliakim. Eliakim is the father of Azor, and Azor is the father of Zadok, and Zadok is the father of Akim. Akim the dream, Achim. Akim is the father of Eliad, and Eliad is the father of Eleazar, not Ebenezer. It's a different story. Eleazar, the father of Matham. Matham is the father of Jacob, but not the Jacob we already talked about. They book in these things. Jacob, the father of Joseph, who's the husband of Mary, of whom was uh, born Jesus, who is called the Christ. So there were 14 generations in all from Abraham to David, 14 from David to the exile, and 14 from the exile to Christ. Now, I would say the end, but that's really just the beginning. Now we're going to have a quiz. <laughs> See, you read through that, and it's just this wall of names Names you've never heard of before. Names you can't even pronounce. I'm not even sure if I pronounced them right. All these names, you don't know anything about them. It's just like this name after name after name. And yet it is so significant. Let me try to illustrate it this way. Two months ago, I ran the Portland Marathon. The day before, I was at the Expo, and there were these panels. They're like nine or ten feet tall, these panels. And they were everywhere. I've got a picture of one of these panels. Panel with the uh, Portland Marathon logo. You could take your picture in front of it, kind of prove that you were there, at least at the expo, and all that. It's kind of a beautiful little blue backdrop with some texture, kind of a, a frosty, uh, frosty white blue backdrop. And yet, if you zoom in, you begin to realize that's not just a backdrop. That what seemed to be just this wall is actually a wall of names and I had to deface the one to just make sure people knew that I was there. <laughs> it was the names, and every name has a story. Every name has a story. If you sat down and talked with them, they're not just a wall of names. You might not have ever heard of them. You may have not even be able to pronounce their name, but they've got a story. Which marathon is this for them? Why are they running it? What's their motivation? How many times have they done Portland? What's their time goal? What's their training regimen like? How did the race go for them? And they would have stories. Some of the stories would be good, and some of the stories would be bad, but they all have a story, and they're all very significant. It's true with the genealogy that this wall of names that we just walked through Every one of them has a story, and some of the stories are good, and some of the stories are bad. But it's the resume. It's who I am. Look, this is my family. This is where I come from. And when you think about this being your resume, I mean, think about it. You start off with Abraham. I mean, <laughs> Abraham. Abraham, before there was Elijah, before there was David, before there was Moses, Abraham is the OG. I mean, Abraham's in three different religions point back to him as their father. Judaism, Christianity, Islam, they all say, Father Abraham, his faith, Abraham. Abraham, that's who I am. I'm a part of his line. Jacob, man, saw that stairway, wrestled with the angel. Jacob's name was changed to Israel. Israel, that's where that comes from. That was Jacob. I mean, he's like Israel. And, and Judah and, and the, his brothers, 
<laughs> They're like the tribes, the 12 tribes of Israel. This is incredible. And David, come on. David was the goat before there was ever any other goat. I mean, he is like the Renaissance man. He is a warrior. He is a poet. He's a musician. He writes the songs that makes the whole world sing. I mean, he is a leader. He is a king. He's the apex. Israel never reached its height of what it had to David. And he's this King David, this man after God's own heart. And he's a part of my family line. What a resume. Solomon, the wisest and wealthiest man who ever lived. <laughs> Hezekiah, come on. Hezekiah was king 700 years before Christ and, and he was in Jerusalem and he realized that Sennacherib up in Assyria would probably attack them and they would be sieged and he had to find some way to get water into the city when they were sieged and so he, he had people do this unbelievable architectural engineering deal from 700 BC where they took one group at the, 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 the spring of Gihon and one group at the pool of Siloam and they began to tunnel almost 1,800 feet through solid rock with no technology technology, and they met in the middle so that water could come in. I mean, Hezekiah is a part of my family, Zerubbabel. It's not just a fun name to say. After the exile, what did Zerubbabel do? He rebuilt the temple. That's Uncle Z. This is amazing. This is an incredible resume. Did no, these people are, I'm a part of them. But not all their stories are so glowing are so wonderful. In fact, some of them have some stories that are kind of embarrassing, kind of disheartening, kind of disappointing. You begin to see that if you look into their past, there are some ghosts in their past as well. I mean, you've heard times where they say the names have been changed to protect the innocent. These names have not been changed these names were listed to expose the guilty. And it's like the nightmare before Christmas. So let me just take us on a journey through this all again. Let's talk about Abraham. Yes, the father of religions. Yes, his faith. But if you recall, twice Abraham lied about his wife to save his own skin. Told him, she's beautiful. Told him, hey, that's not my wife. Don't kill me. That's my sister. Man, Abe, don't put on any kind of marriage seminars. Don't take your marriage advice from Abe. And when she can't get, preg can't get pregnant, you know what he does? He sleeps with this young Egyptian servant they have. And when she gets pregnant, he allows her to be mistreated by Sarah. And years later, when they have their, finally have their son, Isaac, Abraham, this deadbeat dad, Let's Ishmael go on his own. It's Abraham. Not a very glowing picture. And Jacob, yes, he was Judah. Yes, he saw the angels. Yes, he wrestled with the angel. Jacob, his name means deceiver. He's got a twin brother. And when they're young, his twin brother is hungry. He's got some food. And he exploits his brother. He says, I'll give you some stew, but you have to give me the birthright. See, the birthright went to the oldest son. And his brother says, I don't care, whatever, I'm ready to die, just give me some food. Jacob exploits his own flesh and blood, his brother. And years later, when his aging father is in his last days, he conspires with his mom to deceive his dad. He goes in, he lies to his father, he's a fraud, and he steals the blessing. This is Jacob. He's, he's exploited his son, uh, his brother, he's stolen the birthright, he's deceived his dad, he's co uh, co collaborate, he's gotten in partnership with his mom to do this against his dad. A and then and maybe this is just kind of a little bit of, I know we don't believe in it, karma. But this deceiver Jacob, when he decides to get married to the love of his life, I shouldn't smile. <laughs> On his wedding night, his father-in-law swaps out the older sister for the one that he loves. He wakes up in the morning like, 
what's this? How did I get married to her? Tough to be a deceiver, isn't it? Judah? Now, and why does it say Judah and his brothers? Because they're the t- tribes? Yes, yes, yes. But maybe that's not it. Judah and his brothers, one of their brothers they didn't like so much because he was daddy's favorite. Got this really cool coat. Joseph, in fact, the Bible says they not only were jealous of Joseph, they hated Joseph. And they found a way, as he was getting away from his dad, they found a way, they plotted to kill him. And it's only because of Reuben, the oldest, that, that, that his life was spared. But they threw him down in an empty well and they began to have lunch as they were preparing to kill him. And then one of the individuals, Judah, has an idea. If we kill him, he's out of our hair, but what do we benefit? Let's sell him. And then this is what scripture says, after all, he is our brother. Oh, so noble. Wow. And so they see this band of Ishmaelites going across the horizon. And Judah puts this, this plan together. Let's sell our brother. What are we gonna tell dad? Well, let's take his coat and let's cover it with blood and take it to dad and say, I, I, we found this. I, you, 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 we don't know. And they lied to their father. And for 22 years, Judah and his brothers have to live with this secret. And then it says Judah, the father of Perez and Zerah, whose mother was Tamar. Now, now you don't even need those details because it's always father to to son, father to son. It should have just been Judah, the father of Perez, the father of Hezron. It should have just gone that way. But why does it put in there this other guy, this, this other brother, this... And, and, and Tamar, the mom. Oh, wait, that's, that's a story we don't like to talk about a whole lot. In fact, I won't go into all the sordid details, but you can read it for yourself in Genesis 38. Because Perez was not Judah's oldest son. In fact, it wasn't his second oldest son. In fact, it wasn't his third oldest son. And in fact, Tamar wasn't even his wife. Tamar was his daughter-in-law who had been married to his oldest son who passed away and was then, by their culture, married to his second son who died. And so Judah says, I'm not letting her marry my third son. I don't want him to die. And so he makes her live as a widow against cultural norms. And his wife died, and, and then Tamar realizes, I'm never going to have a child of my own. And she hears that Judah is coming to town, and she dresses up and disguises herself and poses as a prostitute. And our Judah, line of Judah, Judah in the line of Jesus' genealogy, Judah goes to the prostitute and says, sleep with me. And she does. And she says, what will you give me? And he says, a goat, but I don't have it. And so she sleeps. He sleeps with this prostitute who is his daughter-in-law, who is lying to him, and he's immoral. And she gets pregnant. He doesn't have the goat, and she says, "Uh, leave me something and pledge. Basically, it's kind of like in our day and age, it'd be like, could you leave me your passport and your driver's license? He says, okay. So she gets pregnant, and then he finds out his daughter-in-law is pregnant. And he says, she ought to be killed. That's fine. The man who impregnated me left these with me. And they happen to be yours. We don't like to tell that Christmas story. That from the past. Well, how about like Salmon, you know, who's the father of Boaz, whose mother was Rahab. And first of all, Rahab was from Jericho, if you remember that story. She's a Canaanite. She's not even Jewish. First of all, she's a woman. What's a woman doing in a Jewish genealogy? Women were never included in a Jewish genealogy. You just wouldn't do that. And here's a woman. She's not even Jewish. She's Canaanite. And, and, and she's not only Canaanite, and she's not only from Jericho, and she's got another description that's attached to her. We, we've done this before. Let's do it again. I'll give you a name. You give me the fill in the blank. Attila the... Alexander the, Buffy the, 
John the, Rahab the prostitute. Because well, well, you got a non-Jewish Canaanite prostitute and she's in this genealogy. She's, can't, she's not even one of the people of God. She doesn't follow the Torah. She, who knows how many of these 10 commandments she's broken. The first four for sure because she's following pagan gods and then this whole, you know, committing adultery and lying and all that. And, she, and she's a part of this as well. What's she doing in there? And then Boaz, great story. Boaz, his father of Obed, whose mother was Ruth. It's an incredible story. And Ruth, man, God bless her for her commitment to her mother-in-law. And Boaz is the kinsman redeemer. What an amazing man he is. But Ruth, Ruth is a Moabitess. Like she's not Jewish either. And what's she doing in this story? And I don't know if you know about the Moabites, but that whole clan, the Moabites, they came from an incestuous relationship. I don't even want to go into that one with Lot and his daughters. It's just disgusting. And the Moabites were seen as these, these horrible outcasts to the Jewish. And here she is a part of this story. This is not a good story. Well, David, how about David? He's always a bright spot. David, the father of Solomon, whose mother had been Uriah's wife. Almost like, y'all remember Uriah, don't ya? Uriah the Hittite, this man of valor, this man of integrity, this man of fidelity, this man of loyalty, one of David's mighty men, loyal to, to king and to country lives there in the city of David, has a little house just down the hill from David's palace, loyal to his king. And one day while he's out fighting the battle for the king and for the country, David is at home in his palace and looks down and sees Uriah's wife bathing herself. And the king can do whatever he wants and no one can have any pushback. And he brings her to his palace and sleeps with her. And she conceives, she becomes pregnant. And it's possible that this wasn't a one-time deal. And she becomes pregnant in our King David, our Renaissance man, our man after God own, God's own heart, tries to cover his tracks. He calls Uriah home from the battle, tries to get her to, him to go sleep with his wife. And he says, how could I sleep with my wife when my men are in battle? Yeah, David. How could you sleep with his wife while his men are in battle? David says that this is gonna work, and so he leads him into a drunken, debauched state, hoping that this will weaken his resolve, get him drunk and send him home, and still the man has valor and honor. And when that doesn't work, he is such a trustworthy man that David sends in his hand a confidential message, and it is his own death sentence, and Uriah is killed in battle because David commanded it. David, the father of Solomon, who had been, mother had been, Uriah's wife. Solomon, wisdom, wealth. In his dying breaths, David said, son, follow the ways of God. And one of the things that was very clear is that God had said, do not marry foreign women who will draw your heart away from God. And there's a line in scripture that says, and Solomon loved many foreign women. And he married, this is where I question his wisdom, <laughs> 700 wives. <laughs> many of them foreign, beautiful foreign women that drew his heart away from God. Solomon, the father of Rehoboam, Rehoboam with his hubris split the kingdom. I told you about Ahaz. Shall I go on? We could go on story after story after story. I mean, these people in the resume, to quote the old, old song, they're gypsies, tramps, and thieves. I mean, they're foreigners and they're fornicators and they're failures and they're drunken debauchery, liars, cheats, st stealers, murderers. This is, a, this is a family of unfit, unclean, outcasts and sinners. And this is the resume? Why would, why would these even be included? Some of them didn't even have to be included. These women, they didn't even have to be included. Some of these brothers, they didn't have to be included. 
I mean, if this is your resume, this is not the kind of stuff you want on your resume. You, you want to expunge those from the record? I mean, could you imagine filling out a resume, getting ready to, to, to get a new job, and, and they ask for a, a kind of a history, an employment history? And so you start writing down, well, there was this one job, and actually I got fired from it because I kept falling asleep on my shift. Make sure you include that one. That's a good one. Okay. Oh, and then there was that one time. Oh, yeah. Okay, I was, I was caught stealing from the till a few times, and so I got fired from that job. Well, and then there was that one where, okay, there was that inappropriate relationship with the summer help, and yeah, that, that job didn't last real long. Oh, oh, and then that one, that really good job where, yeah, I know, what, what I, I know, the expense account and all that, and, and yeah, I mean, those are, whew, okay, yeah, make sure you put that. No, you don't want to put those things down. And yet, here it is on this resume. Here it is on this ge genealogy, and it's like they're there intentionally. I mean, these are stories, that they are haunted from the ghosts of the past. There are so many skeletons in the closet. This looks more like a Halloween story than a Christmas story. Why would it be in there? And here's why. If God could and would include people like that in his story and in his family, then there is hope for all of us and anybody. It's story after story after story of failure, of disobedience, of rebellion, of repulsive behavior, and it is met with grace upon grace upon grace upon grace. No matter how hard humanity has tried, we cannot thwart the grace of God. That's the beauty of this horrible story of the genealogy of Jesus. So back to verse 18. This is how the birth of Jesus Christ came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be with child through the Holy Spirit. Well, no, wait, we just got through the genealogy. Now we have an unwed pregnant teenager. Doesn't get any better. And for Mary and Joseph, at separate times, they have some information that's given to them. You know, one of the things that's kind of a, a big deal these days is the, the whole, the gender reveal. You know, get the family together and pop the balloons or let off the fireworks or cut the cake and is it pink or is it blue? You know, it's the big gender reveal. Listen, Joseph and Mary had the gender reveal to top all gender reveals. When you have a gender reveal party and an angel is there to reveal the, the gender, that's like way cool. So Joseph has this angel appear to him in a dream, and it's a gender reveal. Spoiler alert, no ultrasound necessary. You're having a boy. Okay, got that established. And it was the, the duty and the responsibility and the privilege of the father to name the child. But not so here. Joseph doesn't get that opportunity. He's instructed what you will name this child. You're gonna name him Jesus, which is the Greek version of the Old Testament name Joshua, or Yeshua, which means the Lord saves. And as you know in Scripture, names are very important. And this one, even more so. The name Jesus, it's his identity. It's who he is. He's the Savior. Now, it was a common name, but for Jesus, it was different. He is the Savior. He is the Rescuer. It was not just who he is, it's, it's why he came, it's his purpose. And it wasn't something that Joseph came up with of, oh, we're gonna name him this and hope he grows into it. No, this was established from the beginning. Verse 21 says, she will give birth to a son and you are to give him the name Jesus. Why? Because he will save his people from their sins. His people, his family, his lineage. So maybe all of those misfits were put in that not in spite of their sin, but precisely because of their sin. Because it illustrated from the very beginning, this is why we need a savior. Abraham needed it, Jacob needed it, David needed it, they all needed it, we need it. This is the story of Christmas. To give to sinners and outcasts what they can't do for themselves what we can't do for ourselves. 
And hear me out, it's not in any way glorifying their sin. It's not justifying their sin. It's not rationalizing it. It's not watering it down. It's not downplaying it. It's not excusing it. I think in this genealogy, it's spotlighting their sin to magnify God's grace. And what does Paul say? Should we go on sinning so that grace may abound? By no means. And we've been saved from that. But our ghost stories become God's grace story. And Jesus would say later in Matthew chapter nine, for I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. See, Jesus comes from a long line of sinners. And he comes for a world of sinners. And it's sinners that he accepts and forgives and adopts and brings into his family tree. Takes our broken stories and makes them part of his redemption story. From this broken family to be in this family of grace, from the hall of shame to this wall of the fame of God's grace and goodness. Hebrews chapter seven says, therefore, he is able to save completely those who come to God through him because he always lives to intercede for them. Always lives. That sounds like present tense, so that's next week, so we better stop. But this is the truth about every single one of us, and this is the beauty of the Christmas story, and this is the beauty of the genealogy, the first Christmas tree, the family tree, is knowing all of our skeletons, all the ghosts that we're haunted by, he still chooses us. He still includes us. He still allows us to be a part of his family. He knows you, and he chose you. And when we live in that reality, it can allow us to be transformed to know that everybody on the face of this planet, and especially those who aren't like us, don't think like us, don't believe like us, don't vote like us, don't live like us, don't believe any of that, that no one is outside the reach of God's grace. If he could do what he did through Matthew 1, 1 through 17, he can do it in our lives, he can do it in our world. And to live in that reality for ourselves and for those that we have contact with every single day. The Christmas past is not just ghost stories, it's a grace story.